um, we believe that beauty begins in the belly and we create probiotic, bio-fermented elixirs and powders for gut health, skin health and well-being. We're really passionate about helping people to be um, the healthiest and happiest versions of themselves uh, by not only creating really efficacious, clean products, but also creating educational content that really sheds light on the importance of gut health, skin health and, for, and well-being. And so I guess my journey to starting The Beauty Chef was a very organic one and really stems from my own experience with gut, gut issues and skin issues and that of my family's. And as a child um, and teenager, I had eczema and allergies and my mum took me to see a naturopath and she said I was allergic to a whole lot of different foods so we eliminated you know, dairy and gluten from my diet that were hard on my digestive health, introduced other foods and I saw such a dramatic change in my skin health, the way I felt, my focus. And so from a very young age, I really learned the power of food as medicine. And that what we eat can profoundly affect not only how we look, but also how we feel. So fast forward years later into my early career as a journalist, and I became a beauty editor um, for a mainstream newspaper. And I was inundated with lots of beauty products. And at first I'm like, cool. I've got all this beauty beauty, this is fantastic. Um, but very quickly I became quite concerned with the amount of toxic chemicals at that point, and this is a long time ago now, um, and clean beauty was very, very niche. And so I did my research and I thought I really can't hand on heart write about these products because I had women from all over Australia writing to me saying, what do you recommend for psoriasis, for eczema, for acne? For premature aging and I'm thinking I can't hand on heart recommend any of these products and I know that beauty from you know it's really an inside out job to have that radiant clear skin so I quit my job and I wanted to help change it's like I'm on a mission to change the paradigm in the beauty industry and to help educate people about how to look after their skin in a far more holistic way so I wrote a book for Penguin in 2004 called Feeding Your Skin and became um, the editor, the beauty editor for Wellbeing magazine. And I penned a column for uh, the Sunday Telegraph for around six years called Do It Yourself Beauty and became the um, ambassador for the Biological Farmers of Australia for 15 years in organic skincare as well as um, Australian organic. So really passionate about clean beauty for human health but also for the environment as well. And then my daughter, who's 23, but when she was uh, about 10, so 13 years ago, she also experienced allergies and eczema. And I was doing some research, and I stumbled across some research that looked at the link between certain types of gut bacteria and allergies and eczema. And as I explored it further, I decided to put my family on a gut healing protocol. And this not only included removing certain foods like gluten and dairy that I had done as a, as a kid, but introducing other gut healing foods so your probiotic, lacto-fermented foods that are time-honoured. So your, you know, kefir, kombucha, sauerkraut. Kids weren't so mad on kimchi, um, but I loved that. And um, so we were eating a lot of these foods, and my daughter eliminated a lot of other foods from her diet and introduced other foods. And I saw such an incredible change in her skin, her well-being, her focus at school. And then friends and family and people saying, Carla, what are you doing differently? Your skin's looking really glowing and radiant. And I said, the only thing I'm doing differently is eating these probiotic-rich fermented foods. And so then I did become like the local pusher for fermented foods around. And I was like, can I have some of what you're having? Can I have some of your, you know, the bacteria that you're growing in your kitchen? And so really from there, and what I loved is that people were saying, not only does my skin feel better, but... I have more energy, I feel better, I have more vitality and I feel better within myself. And so in 2009, Glow Inner Beauty Powder was born, our first powder in the Beauty Chef range. 24 biofermented superfoods with prebiotics, probiotics and postbiotics for lease um, for radiant skin and well-being. And at the time, it was the first product um, you know, in the market. We'd created an inner beauty category and people were like, this is so weird. Um, this powder, it's inner beauty, don't you put beauty products on your skin? It's fermented, that's gross. It's full of bacteria, that's gross. Um, what do you mean your gut can impact your skin? And so it's been amazing, it's such a huge educational journey. Um, and what I love over the last 12 years is to see that gut health is mainstream. People are talking about it, people understand the benefits of probiotics um, and gut health for, for beauty and well-being, which is really exciting. And I love the fact that people 
you know, before they've even thought about putting on um, their moisturiser, let alone, you know, their foundation. They've whipped up a kale and coconut and Beauty Chef smoothie in the morning, which is awesome. And I guess, you know, we are at the Beauty Chef so lucky we work with um, a team of microbiologists, naturopaths and nutritionists. And one thing that I love that they all agree on is that the most profound impact you can have um, to your gut health and microbiome and therefore your overall well-being is diet and lifestyle. And I love the fact that I started the Beauty Chef in my kitchen 12 years ago, but we're working with leading microbiologists who are also obsessed with fermentation. Because fermentation, even though it's time-honored, it's really at the forefront of a lot of the research that's being done at the moment in terms of the microbiome, the microbiome and, and gut health. And really important for people to understand why is the gut so important? Because your gut not only regulates your you know, skin health, but also your immune health as well as your metabolic health and your brain health. And fermented foods, it's really exciting, um, are playing a really important part in this movement to understand how they can impact your microbiome in a really positive way. So the Beauty Chef, we've partnered with um, the Charles Perkins Centre, so we're 18 months into a partnership with them. Um, we've sponsored a PhD student under the guidance of the gorgeous um, Associate um, Professor Andrew Holmes at Charles Perkins and we're looking at the post-biotic post -biotic benefits, and I'll leave post-biotic to you, um, I'm sure you can explain it better than me, um, of fermented food. We're also looking at the impact that diet has on the microbiome and ageing and also cardiovascular health. So we're really excited. We've also just launched our, um, our own state-of-the-art fermentation plant that we've been building over the last five years. So I have been working with these two leading microbiologists. I'm so excited because we now can produce, our products were amazing, and now we're gonna produce products that even have higher nutrient value and also probiotic outputs. So really excited. Um, so that's my little you notes know, to share with you all, but you know, so passionate about the microbiome, which is why it was so great to have Professor um, Felice Jeffers join us today to talk about, again, how important gut health is in the microbiome. She is a director of the Food and Mood Centre at Deakin University in Melbourne, and she's also the founder and the president of the International Society for Nutritional Psychiatry. She's been responsible for the development of a highly innovative field of research establishing diet and nutrition as of importance to common mental disorders. Her work is absolutely groundbreaking and inspiring, and I have no doubt she and her team will shift the paradigm in the way that we look at treatments for mental health moving forward. I came across Felice's work probably around three years ago when I was writing the book, my book for um, The Gut Guide. And Dr. Andrew Holmes told me about how amazing her work was when he was writing the forward for my book. And so then I became intrigued and looked at all of the incredible innovative research, absolutely fascinating, that she and her team have done and have been leading, and her work really resonated with me. We connected last year and we have discovered that we have a shared passion for fermentation, the microbiome, gut health and nutrition. Felice and I are currently working on a few projects that we hope to bring to life in the next 18 months. I'd love you to, to introduce you to Felice because I would really love her to share with you some of the incredible projects that her team are working on at the moment. So welcome oh, Felice. You. Everybody has a brain. Everybody is affected by mental health of some sort or another. Uh, and of course everybody eats. And I've always had a really strong passion for nutrition and that was just a personal passion. It wasn't a scientific passion. My first degree was in fine art. I never expected to find myself <laughs> as a scientist. It was completely unexpected. Um, but I guess the first thing for me is I always put things into a context and I'm sure that this is not something that you would uh, necessarily have not noticed, but poor diet and the sequelae of poor diet, such as you know high fasting blood glucose and high blood pressure and obesity, these are now the leading causes of illness and death right across the world. So overweight now kills more people than underweight. And this, of course, has arisen as a result of the industrialisation of our food system. And that industrialisation is now costing the globe, in terms of the health and the environment, upwards of $12 trillion a year. By 2050, it's expected to be about $16 trillion, which is equivalent to the whole GDP of China. 
it's massive and yet you know industries that create these uh, ultra processed food products mm. they comprise something like 70 of the top 100 major companies in the world and they really have untrammeled access to populations there are virtually no limits on their activities um, their ability to market their products to make them ubiquitous to make them super cheap and they spend billions designing them to interact with all the reward systems in our brain now at the same time mental disorders and that's across the spectrum from depression and anxiety but also schizophrenia etc account for the leading global burden of disability because of course they affect so many people and they interfere with people's ability to to work and to have good family functioning and their use of uh, you know welfare system and criminal justice system etc and in particular the common mental disorders depression and anxiety disorders uh, they're the biggest chunk of that and they impose a really huge burden. So when I found myself sort of accidentally coming into psychiatry research, I was really intrigued to recognise that there was virtually no research that had been done looking at how what we eat might influence our mental health. And this is kind of crazy because of course if you think about chronic disease, heart disease and all of those things, we've known for a very long time that what we eat every day makes a big difference to those and of course why wouldn't it this is the fuel that you know it, mm. it runs every single process in our body mm. but in psychiatry there's a whole lot of factors that have led to a sort of ignorance or a, you know really ignoring the influence of diet and nutrition partly it's around the way physicians are trained you know they're trained that the mind and the body are somehow separate mm. and that the brains over here and you make drugs that influence little molecules in the brain and so they haven't historically recognised uh, the human body as this one highly complex integrated system. Secondly, there have been a lot of really poor, I guess, uh, what we call woo. There was a field of, um, we call it orthomolecular medicine, that's what they call themselves, that had made a lot of very unfounded claims with no evidence about you know, nutritional deficiencies in serious mental disorders, and nutritional supplementation for mental disorders all without any evidence and it had brought this whole idea that nutrition might be important to mental and brain health into disrepute but when i came into psychiatry research and i came in because i was really i had my own personal experience of quite severe anxiety disorders and chronic major depression during my adolescence and early adulthood and I studied psychology and I realised I was really interested in the brain and, and, you know, the biomedical side of psychology. Around that time, there was this increasing understanding that actually our immune system was really important mm. in mental health. Mm. There's a bi-directional relationship. People who have mental health problems are more likely to have immune dysfunction, which we know as inflammation. Uh, and also that inflammation, which is when your immune system is inappropriately activated, long-term chronic activation, all of the little molecules that run that particular system mm. can cause a whole host of problems. So they're causally involved in heart disease, for example, obesity, cancer, etc., but also in uh, particular major depressive disorder. Around the same time, there was this increasing understanding that, you know, when I grew up, we thought that the brain, you were born with your full complement of neurons and you would just lose them over your life course. Nothing else ever grew in there. But then they discovered this region of the brain called the hippocampus that was highly plastic. And now this is a real, really key seat of learning and memory, but also very much involved in mental health. It's the main target actually of antidepressant treatments. And that it grows and shrinks in response to a whole host of environmental factors including diet and exercise and so there was these increasing leads to suggest that what we ate may indeed be really important for mental and brain health and given that half of all australians will experience a mental disorder at some point in their lives it's incredibly important to think about how to address this now i was the inaugural president of the australian alliance for the prevention of mental disorders in australia and prevention is really tough because all of the costs are incurred up front, the benefits are down the track, politicians don't want to fund it, it's very difficult. But it's also the case that with mental disorders, so many of the things that we know increase the risk for mental disorders are things that aren't necessarily easily addressed. Poverty and disadvantage, early life trauma, our genes, these things are much more difficult to intervene and prevent. The 
recognition that diet and exercise, which are really modifiable, are actually risk factors for mental disorders, of course, has huge implications. So when I came into psychiatry research, I suggested this idea of looking at the quality of people's diets and whether or not they had a clinical depressive disorder and just looking at that association. Taking into account, of course, things like, you know, their, their income and education, body weight, other health behaviours, etc. And people just thought I was bonkers. And of course, you know, medicine is full of old white dudes and <laughs> psychiatrists. And they would kind of roll their eyes and the snarky ones were outright rude and the, you know, the more patronising ones would just be like, pat on the head, you know, that's quaint. No one thought for a second that there would be a link. So I did my PhD and showed exactly as I hypothesised in this large sample of Australian women, very representative of the population, that the quality of their diet was really clearly linked to whether or not they had a clinical depressive disorder, a clinical anxiety disorder, independent of all those other factors. Now this was considered so gobsmackingly strange that it made its way onto the front cover of the American Journal of Psychiatry, which is a huge deal. And it was nominated the most important study in psychiatry research in 2010, simply because no one had just thought about it like that. Whereas to me, it just seemed like really obvious. Mm. And when I talk to people, they'd be going, but I know that what I eat has an impact on the way I feel. Mm. Like why wouldn't this? Mm. But the point is that unless you have scientific evidence, nothing changes. Policy doesn't change, clinical mm. practice doesn't change. In medical research, there's usually 17 years before between generating research evidence and it's mm. making its way into clinical practice. And my aim has been to shorten that mm. and to truncate that. And in that I've been really successful. So I worked really hard over the next few years to establish this evidence base. I led the first studies in right at the start of life. We looked at 23,000 mothers and their children in Norway. We looked at the quality of mum's diets during pregnancy, the quality of children's diets, the children's mental health and showed again this link. In adolescence, half of all mental disorders start before the age of 14. We showed over and over again that the quality of their diets was linked to whether or not they had elevated depressive symptoms, poor mental health. And then right at the other end of life as well, you know, many people develop depression as they age. And you know, ageing is pretty tough, it's not all that surprising. And all these mm -hmm. uh, biological changes of course lead to that as well. And we showed again that the quality of their diets was intrinsically linked to whether or not they developed depression. And then all of that work in, in, in animal studies that show that you could manipulate diet and then manipulate the hippocampus and an animal's ability to learn and remember and its behaviour, we showed that this was also the same in humans. So older people who had a healthier diet had a much larger hippocampus than those who had a smaller diet. And remember, this is the seat of learning and memory. So it's really important right across the life course, but as you age, you really don't want a small hippocampus. Mm. So this was really groundbreaking work, and I also set out to make sure that my work was very heavily featured in the media, because that's how you shrink that 17-year gap. Mm. So we've had a huge amount of media across the world in all of the major uh, magazines and etc., cetera, etc., cetera and documentaries and television shows and things like that. But in 2017, I led the very first trial that showed that if you took people with clinical depression, moderate to severe clinical depression, and you helped them to improve the quality of their diet, it had an absolutely remarkable effect. Mm. Now remember, depression, there's been no new treatments for depression for decades. Mm. Even with our very best antidepressant psychotherapy, it still only helps about 30 to 40 percent of people. Huge burden of illness in the community. And of course, once you have a mental disorder, whether it's depression or schizophrenia or anything else, you're at massively increased risk of cardiovascular disease, diabetes and obesity because of all of the complex systems mm. that are dysregulated when you have a mental disorder. So taking a dietary approach to treatment was incredibly powerful because not only did it really substantially help people's mental health mm. but it obviously really helped them in the broader functioning we found it was highly cost effective there's about a three thousand dollar cost saving for everyone who got the dietary intervention which was just basic support with a dietitian to increase vegetables fruits legumes nuts and seeds these sort of core foods and also reduce mm. highly ultra processed foods it was 
massively impactful on their general functioning. They lost less time out of work, they saw other health professionals less often, and more than 30% of them went on to have full clinical remission. They were not depressed mm -hmm. anymore. You never see that. Mm -hmm. It was about four times the effect size of what you see with antidepressants. Mm -hmm. So this was huge. All over the world, people were like, wow, I can't believe it. Change your diet, change your mental health. Mm -hmm. Duh. <laughs> <laughs> so since then, there have been a number of other trials that have showed the same thing, and there's an increasing body of evidence to support this. And it's really important because, of course, correlation doesn't equal causation. You have to have the research to show mm. that this is uh, what happens when you change diet. But it's so critical that we get this into policy and practice. 75% mm. of junior physicians in America and Britain don't feel qualified to offer nutritional support to their patients. And there's a whole host of reasons for that. They don't get any training. But of course, the food industry has made its mission to confuse people about what a healthy diet actually entails mm. so they're too scared to say this is what you should be paying attention to so they don't they just antidepressants go and see a psychologist which the better access scheme it's great in theory but it's hugely expensive mm. and it's not led to any <laughs> <laughs> so actually mental health has not improved for 17 years in Australia, even wow. with all that increased investment and stigma reduction and everything else. So now we're working on getting this into clinical practice and basically making what we call lifestyle medicine, so diet, exercise, sleep, stress reduction, smoking cessation, the fundamentals. My work informed the updated clinical guidelines for the treatment of mood disorders by the Royal Australian New Zealand College of Psychiatrists. They said this should be step zero for everybody, but that doesn't happen because they don't have the training or the wherewithal. So a lot of the work we're doing now is about developing and testing these new models of care and we hope that we will actually be able to overhaul the way mental health care happens in Australia. A huge shift. Just last week, the submission I made to the Productivity Commission, the Mental Health Report of the Productivity Commission, for the first time recognises diet and exercise as key factors that influence people's mental health. And now we have um, many things underway, but what we're doing at the Food and Mood Centre is trying to answer those questions, what works, for whom, under what circumstances, and how. And it's the how that led me and uh, to Carla, and um, I met Andy through being on Catalyst with him, this three-part series of gut health. And I'm just so intrigued to know that you were onto the gut thing in 2009. That's really pioneering. Because people thought I was completely bonkers talking about poo transplants. <laughs> Even just five years ago. And getting funding for this research is almost impossible because people are like, what? Gut? No. But if we think about the factors that influence mental and brain health, and we're not just here talking about depression and anxiety, but things like Alzheimer's disease and um, MS and a whole host of other things, uh, uh, the immune system is incredibly important. <laughs> Our metabolic system is intrinsically linked. We don't fully understand it, but we know it plays a role. You've got the way our genes are expressed and what they do all the way through our body. Uh, obviously your stress response system and then this brain plasticity, this region of the brain with the hippocampus. And now we know that the gut is absolutely integral to all of those things. So the microbiome, the microbiota that live on us and in us, we've co-evolved with it. They can't live without us, we can't live without them. They play a really important role in our health and we're only just starting to really uncover this. It's very, very complex. But we know when you talk about the gut, which is where the largest reservoir of our bacteria are, that when they're primarily there to help us break down food, that our human enzymes can't break down. And that's fibre and polyphenols primarily. So when you eat this sort of food, it makes its way into the gut, doesn't get absorbed further up, and the gut bacteria break it down, and it's the process of fermentation and the products that are produced these postbiotics that do all of those myriad things within the body. 70% of our immune system is in the gut. They run the immune system, our metabolic health and body weight, our uh, brain plasticity, our, the way our genes are expressed. They produce neurotransmitters. They produce these short chain fatty acids. 
many, many of these what we call biogenics that we're only just starting to find out about. Now, of course, if you don't have fibre, if you don't feed those bacteria, you get a very sad gut. And that's a situation in the West where people's bacterial diversity has gotten smaller and smaller and smaller, and at the same time our allergic diseases have gone through the roof. If you look at the way allergic diseases in children and asthma and allergy, it's just like... And actually Melbourne is the, the capital of food allergy in the world. We don't even really know why. But antibiotics all the way through the food system have played a huge role in this as well as the fact that we're eating these horrible, horrible diets of highly processed food products. So with our, our centre, we do more than 20 big research projects just at the moment. We've grown really rapidly, I only set it up three and a half years ago. We've got nearly 30 people now, postdocs, PhD students, all looking at different aspects of this. One of the things we're doing next year is a, a, a trial of fecal microbial transplantation. There are all these case studies of people with very severe mental disorders having quite remarkable, um, you know, complete recoveries after a, an FMT. We're working with the Australian Blood Service with their new microbiome stool bank to develop capsules, and we will test it in a randomised control. I love that. <laughs> capsules. <laughs> that is that's brilliant. But the FMT stuff is so fascinating. And so I had cancer. Some of you who follow me on social media will know I had breast cancer last year. The end of last year, this year has been particularly horrible for me. I had um, a double mastectomy, I had chemotherapy, I had radiotherapy, I had more surgery. It's just been revolting. And Carla's stuff was absolutely essential to getting my gut back on track because when you have chemo, it just destroys your gut. But in cancer, this new field of immunotherapy, which is offering new hope to people all over the world, only about 20 to 40 percent of people respond to immunotherapy but when they do they can be completely cured it's almost a miracle and now it looks like the gut is absolutely essential in uh, determining whether or not you respond to immunotherapy whether or not you recover from cancer and now they're doing fmt in cancer taking stool from people who have responded to immunotherapy putting it into those who haven't responded it's just remarkable. So we want to test this in major depressive disorder. We want to then go on if it's successful and look at things like MS, maybe even chronic fatigue syndrome. We just think the gut is a central focus. And the lovely thing about it, of course, is that you can manipulate it. Diet's the most important factor that affects it. You can affect it really quickly and you can measure it, even though it's complicated. So a lot of the work we do is funded by philanthropy because it's really hard to get funding for research that is really you know, pushing the boundaries and seen as being very uh, revolutionary. But basically we're having a huge impact on the way people think about mental health.